like to uh, thank uh, Deepak Ji Bandari for hosting uh, from the Hotel Mandap. Thank you very much. A man who I'm very impressed with, uh, who is the leader here and who has organized this particular group. I would like to have uh, Sunil KC come up and maybe say a few words if you would please. Thank you, Zim. Zim is a very good friend of mine. Uh, a very warm welcome, everyone, and especially uh, Dr. Ernesto Sinoli, who is a leading uh, uh, consultant on economic development, development and he's very famous uh, on the trade job. And then today we have with us uh, Dr. Ernesto Sinoli uh, on our event, Enterprise Facilitation. And then I'm speaking here on behalf of ACN Institute of Diplomacy and International Affairs, and then he's a president. The event which is organized. And then thank you very much for your active participation in our event. It's all week and tonight we're presenting something new, something that has never been seen before in Nepal. For 50 years, someone who looked like me, someone with this face, for 50 years. People who look like this have been coming into Nepal, giving you programs, and trying to tell you what's good for you, right? Is that correct? For 50 years, they've had a plan for Nepal. For 50 years, they never asked you what your plan was, did they? Let me ask you this. What if for once, in the history of Nepal, this face, came to you and just shut up and listened to what you had to say. That would be new, wouldn't it? Huh? What if for once, this face, and all it represents in the Western world, got behind your ideas and supported what you wanted to do instead of standing on top of you and telling you what to do? Do you think Nepal is ready for that? What's that? Why not? That's what we, I told you my Nepali was bad. <laughs> That's what Dr. Ciroli's Enterprise Facilitation Program represents. It represents a chance for the Western funding, ideas, and the things that we do so well to not lead you, but be a partner behind you. To listen to your ideas and see if there's something else we can do to help you. It also re represents, to a small extent, an apology. An apology for 50 years of aid that hasn't always worked for this country. Maybe sometimes, mostly not, right? So, we will start the program tonight with, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen Dr. Strong's TED Talk. Are you, you're young on computer, you guys all know the TED idea. This is, uh, Dr. Sorolli's TED Talk is famous, uh, over two million downloads, uh, so it's one of the most popular TED Talks uh, available today. And we're very fortunate that, uh, of all places in Asia, his first trip to Asia, he's picked Kathmandu. And that says a lot for what we've accomplished with our elections. We've come through a difficult time, haven't we, the last 10 years? And now all of us, especially the young people, are starting, starting to breathe fresh air again, right? starting to think, starting to have ideas and dreams. All of you have a dream. And this is what the Soroli Institute and the Enterprise Facilitation Program represents. So, sit back, listen, enjoy the video. It's funny, and it also tells a deep truth. So you'll get both of that tonight. Anish, can you get us started? Thank you. <laughs> Everything I do, and everything I do professionally, my life has been shaped by seven years of work as a young man in Africa. From 1971 to 1977, I look young, but I'm not. <laughs> I worked in Zambia, Kenya, Ivory Coast, Algeria, Somalia, in projects 
of technical cooperation with African countries. I worked for an Italian NGO and every single project that we set up in Africa failed and I was distraught. I thought, age 21, that we Italians were good people and we were doing good work in Africa. Instead, everything we touched, we killed. <laughs> Our first project, the one that has inspired my first book, Ripples from the Zambezi, was a project where we Italians uh, decided to teach Zambian people how to grow food. So we arrived there with Italian seeds in southern Zambia in this absolutely magnificent valley uh, going down to the Zambezi River and we taught the local people how to grow Italian tomatoes and zucchini. And of course the local people had absolutely no interest in doing that so we paid them to come and work. It's magnificent tomatoes. In Italy a tomato will grow to this size, in Zambia to this size and we could not believe and we were telling the Zambians look how easy agriculture is where the tomatoes were the nice and ripe and red overnight some 200 hippos oh, the hippos and the Zambia said yes that's why we have no agriculture here <laughs> why didn't you tell us you never asked I thought it was only us Italians blundering around Africa, but then I saw what the Americans were doing, because you see, at least we fed the hippos! <laughs> you should see the rubbish! You should see the rubbish that we have bestowed on unsuspecting African people! You want to read the book? Read Dead Aid by Dandisa Moyo, Zambian woman economist, the book was published in 2009. We, Western donor country, had given the African continent two trillion dollars American in the last 50 years. I'm not going to tell you the damage that the money has done. Just go and read her book. Read, read it from an African woman, the damage that we have done. Patronize them, or we are paternalistic. The two words come from the Latin, two different things. Paternalistic. I treat anybody from a different culture as if they're the white people in Africa are called Guana, boss. I was given a slap in the face reading a book, Small is Beautiful, written by Schumacher, who said, above all in economic the first principle of A is respect. This morning, the gentleman who opened this conference lay a stick on the floor and said, can we, can you imagine a city that is not near Colonia? I decided when I was 27 years old to only respond to people. And I invented, you shut up, you never arrive in the community with any ideas, and you sit and we find out what that person wants to do. The passion back then, so years and years ago, I had this idea, why don't we for once, instead of arriving in the community to tell people what to do, why don't for once listen to them, but not in community meetings, but in a public meeting, what they want to do with their own money. What opportunity they have identified. So planning has this blind spot. The smartest people in your community, you don't even know. Family doctor of enterprise, the family doctor of business who sits with you in your house, at your kitchen table, at the cafe, and helps you find the resources to transform your passion into a way to make a living. I started this as a tryout in uh, in Esperance, in Western Australia, I was doing a PhD at the time, trying to go away from this patronizing bullshit that we arrive and tell you what to do. And so, what I did in Esperance that first year was to just walk the streets 
Canadian fish for sushi to Japan for fifteen dollars a kilo. And the farmers came to talk to me saying, hey, you know, man, can you help us? In a year I had twenty-seven projects going on and the government came to see me to say, how can do you do that? How can you and I said, I do something very, very, very difficult. I shut up and listen to them. We've done in 300 communities around the world. We have up to start 40,000 businesses. There's a new generation of entrepreneurs who are dying of solitude. Peter Draca, one of the greatest management consultants in history, died aged 96 a few years ago. Peter Draca was a professor of philosophy before becoming involved in business. And this is what Peter Draca says. Oh. In a community of 10,000 people, we get 200 clients. Can you imagine a community of 400,000 people, the intelligence and the passion? Which presentation have you applauded the most this morning? Local, passionate people. That's who you have applauded. So, what I'm saying is that entrepreneurship is where it's at. We are the end of the first industrial revolution, no renewable fossil fuels, manufacturing, and all of a sudden, we have system technology for the green revolution. Universities, forget about it. <laughs> Government, forget about it. We be entrepreneurs and they're doing it now. They are seeing this dirty technology that is going to choke the life out of New York. So what happens in 40 years time, in year 9, the idea of a funny different technology had absolutely taken over. To work with entrepreneurs, first you have to offer them confidentiality, otherwise they don't, they don't come and talk to you. Nobody started a company alone. Uh, basically has two principles. The first one is we believe that there is no geography to intelligence and there is no geography to passion. Uh, my background is in psychology. I studied humanistic psychology and my work has been inspired by Carl Rogers, uh, the founder of client-centered therapy. Uh, Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, Eric Fromm, the post-behaviorist. Uh, they believe that every single human being, every man, every woman, at any given time, have a wish to improve themselves. And we are all the same. So, I do not know you, but I know that you have a dream about yourself, and you have a dream about yourself. I know you. I know that you have a dream about yourself. I know that if you trusted me, we could go and have a coffee and you will tell me what you drink. And I know that what is in this room, there are millions of rupees of business ideas in your heart and mind. There, is, there are dreams for social enterprises, there are dreams that you have for your own education, for your own uh, betterment. We all want to have more, to be more, to become the best that we can possibly become. And ultimately we all share the same dream. The dream is to be able to look in the mirror and like our reflection, like what we see. The dream is to become the man we always wanted to be, the woman we always wanted to be. That's the dream. It's outside. We all the same. So there is absolutely no um, um, ever need to motivate anybody. And we do not believe in motivational theory. Motivational theory is behavioristic and is about behavior control. So the psychology of behavior control is a psychology that uses positive and negative reinforcement. And our society, unfortunately, is still behavioristic if you go to university, if they you do what they tell you to do, you pass. If you say something that is against what the professor wants you to say, they will fail you. 
your parents if you do what they like they will reward you if you do something that they do not like they will punish you so our society is a behavior modification society our uh, psychology the psychology of growth is symbolized by our logo our logo is a pod that is half open and inside the pod there is a seed we believe that each of us is a seed full of potential and if that seed is nurtured that seed is going to grow to its full potentiality and if you are a rose you will become a beautiful rose if you are a cabbage, you will become a beautiful cabbage, and there is no difference. You are going to be the best of your species. And the rose is beautiful, and the beautiful cabbage is a beautiful cabbage. So, uh, enterprise facilitation is being created by someone, me, from a psychology background. I never studied business. Never. And the reason why I see business differently is because I never studied business. Okay? So the first fundamental belief of us is that people are magnificent. So every single person that comes and talk to me, I recognize the incredible potential in that person. Um, and I just yesterday discovered from a, a visiting uh, Indian friend, somebody who's interested in what we do, that there is actually a word in Hindi that is sakshum, and means you are potential. And it's the most extraordinary word that I never heard before, which actually recognizes the potentiality in you, in each of us. So at the beginning of our approach is this belief that people are magnificent. And if only they knew, if only we can nurture them to reach their full potential, uh, our society would be absolutely exquisite. The second belief is something that we have learned by working with thousands of entrepreneurs. I did not know anything about business so I thought that somebody wanted to start a business, he better learn how to run a business. So I started by hoping to meet people who had a passion to make the product, a passion to sell it, and a passion to look after the books. And I really hoped one day to encounter somebody like that. But after working with thousands of entrepreneurs, after training hundreds of enterprise facilitators who work with thousands upon thousands of entrepreneurs, I always ask them the question, have you met the perfect entrepreneur, the one who loves everything? And all my trainees said, no, Ernesto, we still haven't found anybody like that. We keep looking for the perfect entrepreneur but we cannot find anybody. And I was very upset because all my initial entrepreneurs were in New Zealand and Australia, and I was thinking, how is it possible that Australians and New Zealanders are so stupid? And yet we get this magazine from America, and in America they are so brilliant. I was so pissed off, like saying, what's wrong with us? Why can't we do what they're doing in Silicon Valley? Because in those magazines, you know, fortune, um, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, um, you know, uh, one on one, all those magazines, oh, fast company, oh my God, when you read those magazines, your jaw dropped. We couldn't find anybody who could make it, sell it, and look after the money. And then when we read those magazines from America, there was always the face of one person on the cover, and then you read the magazine inside, and there is this 25-year-old who is a genius, has come up with a new IT product, and is a genius with marketing, and is a genius with money, and does, oh my God. 
how come we can never find somebody like that? Until one day I thought, what if these magazines are lying to us? What if it's not true? So what I did, I did the research. I got the book that was written by the guy who had been interviewed in that phony magazine. And I got in his own word how he set up the company. And guess what? He was not alone. Steve Jobs without Bosnia was nobody. Bosnia was the genius who invented everything. Steve was the, you know, was the PR guy, was the marketing guy. Really? Oh my God. So then I had to revisit all my poor clients in Australia and in New Zealand and discover that I treated them with contempt because I thought that my clients were stupid. That's why I had to find somebody to help them with marketing and somebody to help them with financial, financial management. And when I discovered that the big guys in Silicon Valley were never alone, then I said, wait a moment. Let me do the research on the older generation. Let me find out about Henry Ford. So I grabbed the book written by contemporary, not the people who now talk about Henry Ford as if he was this unbelievable genius. No, 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 no. I found the people who wrote the books when he was alive. And guess what? Age 46 had gone bankrupt twice. The guy was a miserable failure. You know who he was? In the trinity of management, product, marketing, financial management, Henry Ford was the product. He was an engineer. The only thing he could do was build engines and cars. So twice he went around borrowing money, saying to people, if you give me the money, I will be, car will be selling, you know, build building cars for sale. So investors believed him, they gave him money, and instead of building cars for sale, he built himself a racing car to race himself because he wanted to be the fastest man in America. So twice the investor pulled the money and he went bankrupt. The third time he goes to Malcolmson, who was a rich robber baron who had made money with coal, coal money, and begged Malcolmson to back him, to say, give me money, this time I will not betray you. And you know what Malcolm said to him? He says, there is only one condition upon which I will give you the money. If my man looks after your financials. So Henry became the product James Cousin, who was the meanest accountant, they described him as this absolutely cantankerous, mean, coal mining clerk. James Cousin was given the power of control of the money of the Ford Co Corporation. So, Henry is making the cars. James Cousin is the chief financial officer. The two of them have absolutely no marketing sense. So with their advisors, they say, how are we going to sell them? And they invented the dealership system that still exists. Uh, you know, uh, your, your city is full of dealerships. Uh, today I saw, I saw the tab of dealerships. And they invented the dealership model. And they started with 470 dealers to sell the Ford cars. Third time, product in the hands of Henry, 407 dealers to sell it, the financial management in the hands of James Cousin. Third time, success. So when I discovered the story of Henry Ford, I went to look at the iconic companies of the world. I went to see, you know, Edison. My God, Edison, 1,000 inventions. Edison is a sacred monster in terms of industrial uh, innovation. And I found the name of one man who could say no to Edison. 
I have found the name of the people who could say no to Carnegie, Edison, Westinghouse, to the giant of industry because they were never alone. So how do we work? The way we work, if a community calls us to say, we would like to accelerate entrepreneurship in our community, can you help us? What we do, we go to the community and we say, okay, uh, we need somebody to, uh, who can hire and fire. We need a group of tough, experienced managers who if the person that we pick doesn't perform, they will be have absolutely no problem and no hesitation in firing. Okay? So I, I need a group of managers. I need five, seven, eleven people, max. These people find the money to pay for the project, and then they put ads in the paper, and we look for an enterprise facilitator. The enterprise facilitator, no MBA please apply. MBA is a bit told that business is pretty straightforward and is inputs and outputs. Business is not inputs and outputs. The variables in business are too many to predict. When everything goes beautifully in your business, your partner runs away with your spouse. When everything is fantastic, there is an avalanche that destroys your village. When everything is perfect, there is a war in your major market. The variables are too many. The people that we want to recruit are people who have experience personally in small business. So we want somebody who comes from a family of entrepreneurs, somebody who has run a business, and possibly we want somebody who at one stage in his or her life, 50% of our enterprise facilities are women, we want somebody who has gone bankrupt. Because if you have not seen the last rupee leave your family, you will have no compassion. Small business is hell. Don't you ever start this business unless you're passionate about it. The word passion comes from the Latin, means to suffer. If you are not prepared to suffer for your idea, get a job because you are going in a small business, in an enterprise, you're going to have up and down, and when you're down, unless you're passionate, you're going to give up. Speak to anybody. Speak to your friends who be, are in business. Speak to your parents, to your friends of your parents, and ask them what does it mean to run a business making money every day, not knowing where the next money is going to come from. So we want somebody who is like that. We want somebody who has seen it, has done it. This person has to have an absolute exquisite reputation in the community. You need to find somebody who is ethical, somebody who will never, ever will steal money from people. You have to find somebody who has incredible compassion, somebody who's a natural gardener, has done it, now he wants to help other people to do it. Personality. You need to find somebody who's a great communicator. You need to find somebody who has a communicated in a very strange way. Not only somebody who likes to talk to people, you need to find somebody who people like to talk to. So you need to have somebody who has incredible personality, somebody that um, has experience, has compassion, somebody who can learn a new methodology. Because that person will be trained by us. And what we're going to train the enterprise facilitator um, to do is to say to people, why did you call me? Listen to your story and then do a very simple little drawing, which is this one. And my facilitators in Africa do the drawing with a stick in the sand. The drawing with the client is always 
like this. You say to the client, this is you. If it's a woman, we put hair. And then we say, okay, to run a successful business, the product has to be great. Marketing has to be fantastic. Financial management has to be exquisite. You, what do you love to do in the business? If you could only do what you love to do, what would it be? Oh, the only thing that I love to do is to breed chicken. I love it. This is what I love to do. Okay, well then, you take care of this, but you are the boss of your company. So look at these two boxes, there is nobody on top. Do you know anybody in your family, among your friends, who's unemployed, underemployed, who would like to make some money, who for 10% of the profit will take the chicken to the market and will take the chicken alive on a bicycle. This is a true story from the Congo. This lady is outside of this little town in the Congo and she has a farm. Do you have somebody who can take 12 chicken a day to the market alive, sell them, and then you can compensate with 10% of the profit? She says, then I'm going to lose 10%. And I said to the woman, no, because in the market, the chicken sell for 20% more than what you're selling them on the farm. So you pay somebody 10% and you still make 10% more. And she said, I never thought about it. Do you know somebody? Yeah, my nephew, he wants to work with me. He has a bicycle. He will he, he love to talk to people. He love to take chicken to the market. Fine. So that taken care of. Do you know somebody here? Do you know somebody who loves money the way you love chicken? <laughs> Do you know somebody who loves the precision? They, they, you know, loves the figures. Somebody who loves to sit in front of the calculator and the computer. No, I don't know anybody like that. Would you like me to find them? Fabrice, our first enterprise facilitator in the Congo, Fabrice as a group of helpers, says to the woman, do you authorize me to ask my, my helpers, my network? Because I have a group of people who come together every month for an hour. They are sworn to secrecy. They, I can tell them only something that you authorize me. Would you like me to see whether they know somebody that can help you? And she says, yes, please. So Fabrice goes to the meeting. The accountant of the Methodist Church says, I'll do it. An hour a month. And the lady says, if you help me, I give you one chicken a month. So now we have this woman whose business has absolutely doubled because has somebody who's now taking 20 live chicken a day to the market which is double what this woman was making. We call this the trinity of management and what we are teaching people is don't you ever start the business alone. Don't you ever attempt to do something that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Richard Branson could not do. Who the hell you think you are? You think you're better than them? They couldn't do it alone? You want to do it alone? Are you crazy? The drama is that when you go to university, now, all over the world, not here, not, not, I'm not talking about Nepal, I'm talking about Italy, Germany, France, now, when you go to university, they teach you to do it. They teach you to write a business plan. You writing a business plan by yourself? If you hate marketing, how can you write the marketing component of the business plan? If you don't understand the finance, how can you write the financial projections? And they still teach that crap? all over the world. 
Why do you? Why don't you learn from the real entrepreneurs if they are not doing it? And they are the millionaires and the billionaires. Why don't we learn from them instead of the university professors? What have they done? <laughs> How much money have they made? How much money they have in the bank? <laughs> Let's learn from the people who make money. How do they make money? Division of labor. You know who writes the business plan? The team writes the business plan. First you form the team, and then the three of them write the business plan. That's what entrepreneurs do. First, first they form the team, and then the team runs a business plan. And there are all these people say, oh, you know, when I, you know, the most important uh, problem for small business is finding the money. That's also bullshit. That's bullshit. And I'll show you why it's bullshit. The banks in Kathmandu have more money than good projects to lend it to. True? They do not know who to trust with the money. Because when you go to the banks, you go alone. And I repeat, there is more money now in the banks in Kathmandu to then good projects for the bank to lend the money to. The banks would be very, very happy to lend the money because right now they're not making any money on what they have in their coffers. They need to lend the money to make money. And they have nobody to trust. So what do you do? I'll show you how you get money. You have you are the original person with the original idea. After working with your enterprise facilitator, you are doing this. You have somebody doing the marketing, and you have somebody doing financial management. So the product person writes the product component to the business plan. This is 15 pages, no more than 15 pages. If it's a very complex scientific product, you make an attachment with 500 pages, but make it as an attachment because the banker will not even be able to understand it. So what you do, you do a 15 page summary of your product, okay? And make sure that you have the CV of the engineer, of the IT person who has come up with the product. Because the banker wants to know who has the expertise here. So make the CV very, very uh, prevalent, okay? So 15 pages on the product, written by the engineer, by the manufacturer, by the artist, by the person who really understands the product. Then you get the marketing person to do 15 pages on the marketing. The strategy, the color, the fact that it can be protected. You put the CV of this person very clearly noticeable so that the banker now knows that this person has been the marketing person for that company, that company has the kind of experience. And then what do you do? You ask the marketing director to go and visit 100 companies and ask 100 companies, take the prototype, visit 100 companies and say, if we start to manufacture this product at this price, would your company be interested to place an order? We don't want an, an order, we want a letter of intent. We would like a letter of intent on letterhead that says that if we produce this product in Kathmandu at this price, your company may be interested in ordering 1,000 units a year, whatever it is. And what you do, you attach 30, 40 letters of intent to purchase on letterhead to the marketing plan. 
And this has to have the logo of the company, the name of the purchasing officer. Say yes, if this product were available at this price, we have this interest. And you, you put it there. Then you get the financial manager to write the financials. So the financial management is written by this person. This person possibly has white hair, has looked after hundreds of millions of rupees for other people. He's a professional. Okay? So if the two of you, one is 16 years old and the other is 18 years old, make sure that your chief financial officer is 70. <laughs> and you have the CV of your chief financial officer and you put all the financials. Remember, no business plan ever asks for one, for round figures. 10 million rupees, 100 million rupees. No business plan is always precise numbers. We need 1,327,000 rupees in the first three months. We need a letter of credit from the bank of 100,000 rupees a month for 12 months. In the second stage, we will need 6 million rupees to build and to expand. So it's all real numbers, okay? And then what you do, you take this document to the biggest consultancy com uh, accountancy company that you can afford and you get the best accountancy firm in Kathmandu to audit your business plan. So the last page is an audit of the, with the name, with the gold seal of the accountancy firm in, on letterhead which says every we have reviewed this information and every information is correct. We have even reviewed all the letters of intent to purchase. Then you put an executive summary. Then you put a cheap cover. Don't spend money because the bankers will hate you. And with this, you go to venture capital people. When do you know that your business plan will be given money? It happens this way. Venture capital people, bankers, they always open your business plan from the back because they want to see how much money are you asking. So the first thing that they will see is an audited statement that says we have reviewed the information and it is correct and accurate. And the banker will say, ah, these people are real. Then it will look at how much money you need and then you come upon the letters of intent to purchase. One, two, three, four, five, six, ten, thirty, forty letters of intent to purchase. And then looks at the technology and says, can you protect this? Yeah. So you say to me that the only thing you need is money, yet we have everything else. And you know that you made the deal when the banker start to salivate, there has to be dribble of saliva coming out of the mouth, out of greed. Because he's saying, oh my God, they only need money. I have, this is the only thing I have, is money. And I can get a share of this. I, the last year, as an enterprise facilitator in Australia, I've taken three companies to one venture capital firm. And they funded all three. The third company, the owner of the bank, funded the business with his own money, not the bank money, his own money. And he said to me, I wish all the people coming to me were set up the way you've done it. And I said to him, how many proposals do you see in a year? He says, 100. How many do you fund? 10. How many are you sorry to see leaving your bank because the technology was so good that you, they were not ready for you, but the technology you loved? He says, 40. I, every year, I send away 40 people with fantastic product, they haven't got a clue what to do here. 
Banks love management. This is division of labor. Now, management is new. It's a new technique. It's a new technique. Management is 300 years old. Management did not exist before the Industrial Revolution. Management was also only in the army before the Industrial Revolution. And in some big churches where you have the Pope and then you have the, the bishops and under the bishop you have the priests, the normal priests. When did management start? Management started with the Industrial Revolution when companies which were enormous had to be run and one person couldn't. So they borrowed the hierarchical structure of the army. First the railways, the steelworks, companies employing one million workers, 150,000 workers, was so successful that it started to trickle down to companies with a thousand workers, 500 workers, 200 workers, 30 workers. Guess what? It works so well that we now have grabbed it and in blue jeans, without an office, on a bicycle in Africa, barefooted, we teach management to the poor people there. And as soon as we teach them management, which is division of labor, they blossom. So this is what we want to spread around the world. Two things, first, you're smart, you're wonderful. Don't allow anybody to put you down. And don't allow anybody from another culture, another, to come here to tell you how to develop Nepal. Because you can do it. You're doing it. I met entrepreneurs in the first, in this last three days. I met people who came in Kamalu with no shoes and now are very, very wealthy people. You have nothing, absolutely nothing, that you should try in terms of ideas, and you haven't. And by the way, today, for the first time, I took a flight, a mountain flight, and I saw your mountains. What the hell are you worried about, guys? This is the Garden of Eden. Oh my God, this is a boutique. This is a niche country. This is a boutique. This, you, you are sitting on one of the most extraordinary places in the world. Have no fear. Your economy, I mean, it's extraordinary what you have. Just manage it. Just attract the best people in the world just for the experience. Oh my God, and don't ever try to do quantity here, do quality. You kidding me? How can you do quantity against China and India? <laughs> do quality, elite, boutique, gem, become the Monte Carlo, the Monaco of Asia. Are you kidding me with what you have? You know, we Italians, we had to make Venice. You know, we had, you know, to get some tourists to come. We had the tower that was straight, nobody came, so we bent it, and so now we go. We had to do that kind of strange things. But you guys, you have the mother of nature. You have the mother of all mountains. You have, you have something that is incomparable. And you worried? So become a gem. This is a gem. Treasure it. Use it. Get inspired by the beauty. Go, go, go back to your tradition. Go back to really, really something that is so unique that nobody, nobody can, can have. So, what we want, you know, in coming to a place like this, is you beautiful, you're in a beautiful place. For God's sake, organize yourself, get some enterprise facilities, get some mentors, get, spread them in the community, uh, make sure that not one of you is alone, and don't allow one ounce of intelligence to go to waste. 
Not one ounce of intelligence should go to waste. Thank you. I would, I would like questions, I would like comments. If you have no question, it doesn't matter. If you have comments about what you have heard, I would like to hear some comments from you. Okay? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, first, I would like to comment, and then I would like to put a question. Uh, myself, Sanan Shrestha, uh, motivational speaker and honey entrepreneurs. Uh, first of all, you have given us the insight uh, what we have been looking, but we have confused ourselves. We have not self uh, confidence within ourselves. But you have given a real clear picture how to run a business and how to go within inside and as you have given the passion because myself also uh, passionate driven and but you have clearly precise that one man cannot be a star but one man can be a perfect but you have to work in a team so you have given clear cut pictures and visions and make our more believe within ourselves and uh, that I'm seeing that everybody over here are the one of the best entrepreneur gather over here so thank you for that facilitations and uh, reminding us one more that who we are. Even though we lot of talk about the work is ourselves, but one more reminding our inner qualities. Thank you for that. And another, uh, you have uh, shared a little bit on uh, uh, motivations and motivations behavior aspects you have talked. So would you uh, 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 clearly clarify that the motivations and the entrepreneurs, how do we uh, pass it up, integrate within ourselves so that we can uh, open up the mind of our circles of the people. Thank you. If you motivate somebody, you assume responsibility for their lives. So if you motivate somebody to start a business and the person mortgages the house and then goes bankrupt and kills herself, it's your fault. Don't do it. <laughs> Unless you prepare to compensate the parents of the poor girl that you have motivated. Unless you prepare to consider the death of the girl, the, the girl your responsibility. You can motivate somebody to play the piano who gives a shit, you know. After a while she, she dropped playing piano. What damage have you done? You have done no damage motivating somebody to play the piano. But you motivating somebody to lose everything? Are you crazy? <coughs> Don't touch it. You only work with self-motivated people. Remember that unless they want to do it, unless the passion, unless they're prepared to suffer for it, they should not go into business. We are not mis mi missionaries for enterprise. Absolutely not. If somebody says to me, the only thing I want to go and do is to go fishing, I say, may I come? Because that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with somebody who says, I want to retire, I want to learn flying fishing. Like, fantastic. Good on you. So don't, don't ever motivate. The other thing is, don't even try, I mean, the audience here is too young to have children. I have five. <laughs> you want to motivate your kids, make me laugh. Nobody can do that. Those buffoons of, uh, you know, behavior modification psychologists, they believe that you can motivate the human. In fact, the founder of the, beha the behavior modification school was an American called Skinner. You know what Skinner thought? Skinner thought that the only difference between men and rats was in the verbal domain. In other words, you can motivate a rat to go and get the cheese through a maze and you can get, you can motivate a man to go through a maze to go and get a reward. This is crap for anybody who's, who has children. Have you ever tried to motivate your kids and see what happens? The first time that you punish your daughter for her behavior, what I would like you to take out of uh, this, this tonight is that nobody should start a business alone and that uh, you have to have somebody that does beautifully what you don't do well. And because psychologically it's impossible to be both an introvert and an extrovert, and because to be somebody who loves to spend eight hours a day doing the books, you probably are an introvert, 
and to go out and publicize your product, you probably need to love people. I think that uh, it's very, very important that the personality of the people involved is considered. So, what I would like you to remember from tonight is don't start the business alone. Do beautifully what you love. Surround yourself with people who can do better than you. The other things in the business, they need to be covered. So successful entrepreneurs only do in the business what they love, but they surround themselves with people who can do the rest. The way you start a company is very simple. The, uh, you can start a company in the, in the, in the kitchen, baking. And uh, uh, I was talking to about this great myth about the most important thing for a business is money. It's not true. The most important business, uh, thing for a business is what you've done, which is the passion of the uh, entrepreneurs who come up with the idea. The entrepreneur can come, can start very, very small, uh, gets the, in time, gets the right team. The moment that death is to go out and look for money, if you don't have family and friends to help you, then the team has another opportunity. That they, as a team, they go to family, friends, angels, investors, uh, uh, um, equity investors, and by banks. So I hope that is, I'm making clear that this is not something that you do in the first year, two years, three years of your activity, even though I have to tell you that I've taken some inventors straight from the invention to this, because the inventor only had a prototype that did not have plastic molding. So they made by hand one thing that then was shown to clients, but to make the plastic molding to produce that thing, they need the money. So according to which industry you are, you may need to form this and go and get money at the very, in very early stages. Social enterprises uh, have to use the same criteria in terms of a social enterprise has to have a very good service, has people that have to know that the service exists, and your money has to be well managed, otherwise nobody will buy your services. No foundation will keep giving you money if you don't have perfect financials, okay? So I hope that this is, this is, uh, this is clear. Am I, have I answered you? What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> Um, I'm still not satisfied, but it's okay. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't know what. what no, no, it's. it's uh, I think. Forgive uh, me I if I'm not. If I don't have no, any no, other. Is, okay. I, I think uh, it's okay to. Okay, to start a lot. So that I will keep seeking that. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's okay to start by yourself. It is to, to, okay to start. With, uh, without money, with money, with a little bit of money from friends and family. I was talking about the great myth about the most important thing is more business access to funds. And what I want to say to people is that there is more money in the banks in Kathmandu than good project to lend it to. If you want to go and get money, you have, there, is, there are some techniques. Okay? Questions? Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Amu Baide. I'm a co-founder of the store Divas Nepal. I'd like to ask some technical question regarding the, the PDT of uh, management. You talked about uh, making a big fat CV for uh, the project. I mean, the product manager, or the marketing manager, or the financial manager. Uh, if I say that, like, uh, I have some group of friends who are very young, who are passionate about what they wanted to do and what they and they believe what they want to do in life and in the, they believe in the product. But you said that you need to have a big CV. And if, I mean like big fast CV, you talk about the significant series. And we started, uh, and if, what if we start, started very early and we don't have any CVs to fill up, but we are still passionate about how to approach, how do you approach a bank or venture capitalist regarding the fund of money? Uh, if you don't have, uh, and I think that what I've done here, I've thrown you something that is far too big and far too. Um, the amount of money that you need for a business uh, can be, can change substantially from very, very little money that you can gather from family and friends who believe in you to 
substantial amount of money that you have to go and seek from the market because your family and your friends cannot give it to you. So you prove yourself, you start small, you start, and then after one year selling all over Kathmandu, your girlfriend will have the evidence that even though she's young, she's incredibly passionate and she has a track record. Our product is in 280 shops. That will be enough <laughs> recommendation to show that she's incredibly serious about this product. Okay? So start and start at the level that you can start with in terms of the level of your business with the money that you can raise and in uh, prove it by actually doing the work, prove that you have the endurance and the passion to go out in the marketplace. Uh, one of the things that I would like you to think about, I'm very serious about the fact that your chief financial officer should be somebody that has experience if you are going to the open market to look for money. Because if uh, three young people with no experience, it would be very, very difficult to, do, to go to angels, investors, or venture capital firms, okay? So I don't want to scare you to say, unless you do this, you will never be in business, but I want to say to you that the division of, the, 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 this, the trade of management has to start as soon as possible, and if you are ambitious about growing, and if you have an enterprise facilitator in a community like this, you could go to an enterprise facilitator to say, can you help us to find a financial manager? And sometimes you can get somebody who's retired from accounting or from being a financial manager who will absolutely love to help a young uh, couple, some young people who have lots of passion, lots of energy, some good products. What happens in Silicon Valley is that you have the 21-year-old nerd, but guess who are the people with the money? The older people, they are going to look for uh, some very, very serious um, ability on your part to keep track of the money and to repay the money. Questions? Comments? It's, it's, it's really a great honor to, to listen to you in person. Uh, in this speech, you, you mentioned something about the difference between inspiring people and motivating people. I know that you know the difference is quite simple, but could you explain more, like, you know, what what it means to, to inspire somebody and what it means to, to motivate you know, to share more light on it. Inspire is that I give a talk and I go away. That's it. And so what happens is that you take my spirit in. Okay? So you don't forget. And now you take my spirit in and you say, that guy says something that that really, really changed my way of thinking about myself and my work. Motivation is I am going now to change you. And I make it my business to make sure that you never ever wear blue again. <laughs> because I don't like it. Because I don't like the fact you look like an American with the jeans and the big buckle and I think that that's uh, it's not Nepalese, and I am going to change your behavior. So I'm going to give you electroshock every time you wear jeans. In the hope that you will stop wearing jeans. I mean, it's ridiculous, but this is basically about, is my idea how you should behave as a Nepalese man. Is my idea, and I'm trying to get you to. It's a little bit what the Taliban's are doing now. If you uh, play the radio, I'll kill you. So you stop listening to the radio. Okay? That's behavior modification. Okay? Inspiration is that it's not my business. I am talking about my life. I go away. You can take my spirit in or not. And, you know, um, I... It's not that I'm in, indifferent. I am really trying to convey a message here. But it's not my vested interest. I'm not a missionary for, a, for enterprise. You see? And if you decide not to become entrepreneurs, it's absolutely fine with me. Okay? Because I think that the world needs nuns, needs uh, uh, priests, needs monks, needs uh, uh, people who do not want to start businesses. So they can buy. 
They, you know, not everybody <laughs> needs to be an entrepreneur. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dipesh Sujana from Nepal Rock Campus, and I'm doing my second year B and B from campus. And I recently co-authored and published, self-published a book uh, named Way to Law School. Your lecture worked, uh, was uh, delivered for me in the sense that uh, I wanted to publish a book. I, I always wanted to be a writer, and, and uh, me and my friend we co-authored co a book. And we had no money to publish the book actually because uh, we are students, and uh, basically law students are known to be bankrupt, and <laughs> and we didn't have money. So here we thought about an idea that let's have uh, some advertisement on the back cover. You know, we have to, we need some. Uh, Finance, or financial uh, donor. So we wanted to have an advertisement on that and the back cover of the book. So I think this division of labor works. Division of labor. Uh, I think it is very re relevant for me because uh, I wish I sh I would could have known about this a few year, few few year weeks before because I think the book was uh, is selling quite well and I, I think we were quite happy about the profits. But I think uh, the division of labor is just definitely very relevant and brilliant. Side. Definitely was an eye opener. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. What I have to say is not actually a question, but yeah. rather to add to what you said. Um, basically, your message was that um, if you have a passion, if you have a drive, if you have a dream, then if you follow it, and you see through it. Where, and I think that applies not just to entrepreneurs. Um, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm a teacher by, uh, by training, by experience, but I, I, I left my teaching profession uh, about 15 months ago. And uh, I've come back um, after spending 25 years abroad. Um, I, I left as a student, and then I started teaching. I went around the world teaching internationally. But all this time that I was abroad, um, and actually long before I left for abroad, um, my dream had always been to go abroad, get education, get some experience, and then come back home to do, to do what I managed to do with all of that through education. And then to inspire those back here to, to pursue what I pursued because my background was such that my, my upbringing, the circumstances in which I, I, I was born, the circumstances in which I was raised was such that I was told that I couldn't do it, I wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, the, the, the societal um, message was that you can't do it because you're, you, you're, you're from the wrong ethnic <laughs> yeah. group. Yeah you're from the wrong socioeconomic group, and so on and so forth and so on. So I basically told myself, no, I'll do it. I'm going to do it, and then I'm going to come back and, inspire others. and make sure that those who are from the kind of background that I'm from, those who find themselves in the situation that I found myself in, make sure that they know that it's possible for them to do it. Um, and <laughs> And it was important for me to be here and, and, and be in the presence of those kinds of kids. For them to see, for them to really even have that little bit of inspiration to, to, to be able to say, ah, if he did it, I must be able to do it. I've got to be able to do it. So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm not motivating anyone. Um, <laughs> At least I hope I'm not. Um, <laughs> like you, I go in, I interact with the kids that I work with. I run a small NGO with a friend of mine, and the NGO basically um, implements education-related projects up in the village, um, northwest of here, um, in, in, in a community that's basically mostly um, Tamangs, and they're a marginalized group in Nepal. And 
we also try to assist uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the most um, mistreated, uh, one of the most um, misunderstood, um, held in disdain, uh, all of that, uh, the Dalits, the, the, the untouchables, so that they can see that their circumstances need not dictate what happens to them. Um, I don't know if I've been successful yet because I've been doing that only for the last 14 months, but I hope I am. Um, anyway, the point is, I agree with what you were saying about passion and dedication and working towards... Thank you very much. Passion and skills, okay? Passion is the fuel, skills are the engine. The fuel without the engine, you're not going to go anywhere. Engine without fuel, you're not going to go anywhere. In fact, passionate people in business who do not have skills, they, that's the most dangerous thing to do. So be careful with that. We've had Dr. Siroli here at the Hotel Manda for the last three days, and he's become like family with us. But, uh, and in the spirit of enterprise facilitation, uh, we've decided that uh, should his entrepreneurial efforts uh, fail him somewhere in the, down in the future, that he will always have a home here at the Hotel Manda. So he's now official. Let's hear it for the new member of the Hotel Manda kitchen staff. Ernesto Cerrone. Hey, would you say a word there? Well, I will never be able to compare with this guy. These guys are really hard. And, yeah. Thank you very much. It was lovely, lovely, lovely present. I will cherish this. Thank you all and travel home safely tonight. Thank you.